It's great to be here tonight and to celebrate discovery. The business I'm in is about discovery, science. That's what it's all about. But maybe your idea of science is that, you know, it's about discovery, but discovery takes place in kind of slow, measured stages in science. That you start out with experiments, you test things, you go back and test them again, and pretty soon it seems like pretty boring stuff, right? <laughs> but in fact, it's those punctuated moments of inspiration that make the difference. Those unexpected events that uh, change things in science. And I'm going to talk to you about one of those things that happened to me tonight. But I also want to point out something else. Who does science? It's those special guys, right, who, who uh, have the kind of eggheads and they're out in ivory towers, they're wearing white suits, uh, wire rim glasses, maybe kind of funny hair. And that's who does science. Well, that's not really right. Anybody can do science. Anyone who's creative, anyone who is curious can be a scientist. So all of you here can be citizen scientists, and I'm going to call on you to join our quest to find zombies in just a little bit. You can do it. <laughs> so where do zombies come from? Well, I discovered that zombies uh, are found in San Francisco, among other things. And I found that by walking into my workplace one day, Hensel Hall on the San Francisco State campus, and I'm walking along, looking down, and suddenly I see these honeybees down on the ground in front of me. And they're sort of wandering around in circles. They're not doing too well. And some of them are on their back, twitching. They've got their tongues out. And this is one of those moments of inspiration, right? Where you can just suddenly see what's going on. And so I immediately thought, manted food. Right? Wouldn't that come to you? Well, this is what I had down in my teaching laboratory. A praying mantid that we brought back from an entomology field trip. She was hungry. She needed something to eat. Bees are great things to feed mantids. So I just happened to have with me a vial. I mean, I'm sure all of you carry vials with you all the time, right? You, know, you don't want to leave home without one of these things because who knows what you're going to find. So I took out the vial, put the bees in it carefully, went down, fed the mantid. She was very happy. She started uh, getting bigger, plumper, laying eggs. And I started making that my regular routine. I do that every day until one day I deviated. Instead, I went up to my office and I set that vial down and forgot about it came back about a week later, picked it up, and looked at it, and there were all these little small brown pupae in it. And that's when I knew that there was something strange happening in those bees, and maybe that's why they were stranded the way they were. And that's when the sort of normal part of science kicked in. I started working with my graduate students, colleagues, uh, Brian Brown at the LA County Museum, Christopher Smith, a colleague next door, my graduate student, Andy Kaur, and a large group of other really talented people to try and piece together and find out what was going on here, to understand why these bees were doing things that were really suicidal for them. And what we found out was it was the result of being parasitized by this uh, little fly, the zombie fly, Apocephalus borealis. This is a fly smaller than a fruit fly. And what it does is to use that uh, structure coming out of the tail end so it's ovipositor to lay eggs into bees. Now normally this native fly lays eggs into bumblebees and yellow jacket wasps. That's its normal host. But at least in San Francisco, it had found out how to use the non-native honeybee. Now that's a big thing because honeybees are really important to us. They're the things that pollinate many of our agricultural crops that are re responsible for much of what we put on our tables. Without honeybees, We'd be eating different things, we'd be paying more for it, and we also wouldn't get honey, which would make the world not quite as sweet a place. <laughs> so how do they do it? Well, here's a, a zombie bee in action. This is a female, she's landed on the, the abdomen of a worker bee, she's inserting those eggs, she's found the, the weak spot between the segments, and she might put 15 eggs into that uh, poor bee in a short period of time. Let's watch that happen. If I could have the video, please. Here's a bee. There they are, kind of like a wolf pack, all over the bee. And pretty soon, that bee has been infected. 
and it will go on, fly away, start operating normally, but then one night it's going to have insomnia. And instead of staying at home and sleeping, it's going to go on a flight of the living dead. So this is a, a beehive right next to the, the building that I work in again. You can see that bank of lights. The bees make a beeline to that light. They die underneath. And what do they become? Maggot machines. And here's the kind of behavior that you see under those lights. Kind of uh, dead man walking kind of behavior, going around in circles, not very well oriented. Within five days or so, things are going to be coming out of it. Now, that bee will die in about an hour. And then things are going to happen inside, feeding on it. Those fly larvae are feeding away. And eventually, about five days later, they come out. And they come out right here. These maggots pushing their way out, forming a little pupae around the, the periphery of the, the bee, going on to produce more zombie flies, starting this whole thing over again. Now, that leads to some really interesting questions. Is this only happening at night when we can find them? Or might it be happening in the day as well? How do you answer those? You get a really bright graduate student involved. This is Christopher Kwok, really bright guy, knows his science. He's, uh, his mentor is Andy Zink at my campus. And what he's able to do is not only do good science, but have steady hands. Because he's putting little RFID chips, radio frequency ID chips, on the backs of these bees. These are the size of a piece of glitter. Imagine. And he's putting it on with a very special substance. We pay big bucks for this stuff. Super glue. <laughs> Individually putting each one down and getting the right side up so it can be red. And then he's constructed this wonderful apparatus with lasers that the bees have to walk out under. When they go under the laser, it tells us that bee number 2532 is on the way out. And then when she comes back, she goes through a different sequence of lasers that tells me she's coming back in. By that way, we can tell if they're leaving their hives during the day uh, when they're parasitized and not coming back at a bigger rate than the other bees in the colony. We can answer that question. This guy is the, the first and foremost bee wrangler in the world. <laughs> All right? And wrangling bees, just as tough as cows. But how about other questions? I discovered this in San Francisco, right on my own campus, but this fly is found all over North America. In fact, it was described from Maine. Its name is Apocephus borealis, borealis from the boreal zone of Maine, from the boreal forest. Could it be everywhere? Could it be causing the same kind of thing in honeybees all across the country? How can we answer that question and answer it quickly? Well, the way we do it is to call on the crowd, all of you, to become citizen scientists, to join me as a zombie hunter. You can do it. All you have to do is be looking for bees acting strangely and join our group. We're calling it Zombie Watch, taking advantage of the notoriety of uh, the zombie thing. Carry a vial with you wherever you go. <laughs> Look for bees that are on the ground under light. Put them in there. Observe them for a week, a little longer, and... Take out your mobile device, send us a picture, upload it to our website, and we can tell whether it's been parasitized or not. We want to know even if you find bees that aren't parasitized, because we want to be able to compare that with those that are. So think about it. See if you could uh, be involved in this. It's pretty easy. doesn't take a, a whole lot of uh, response to, to begin with, but it can really allow us to answer sort of that basic question. Is this something that uh, is going on only in one place? Is it important all across of North America? And is this parasite a major player in the decline of honeybees that we've been seeing around North America? Or perhaps, is it just uh, a minor player in a bee movie? LAUGHTER Now, perhaps, just perhaps, being a zombie hunter isn't your thing, but uh, you want to do other things. You can be a part of this. You can make true discoveries and tell us about the distribution. It's already happening in places like Washington and Oregon. 
We've got uh, a fifth grade class now in Seattle cooperating with a group of engineers from Microsoft who happen to also be beekeepers in trying to analyze what's going on in the hives there. And those kids in a fifth grade classroom are making important discoveries. They're doing science, they're doing real science, and that's making a difference for all of us. But like I said, maybe being a zombie hunter, you're just not quite ready yet. Now, I would like you to join us as a zombie hunter, but there are other things that you can do. If you don't want to be a zombie hunter, perhaps you could grow a sunflower and join the Great Sunflower Project. Grow a sunflower, watch it periodically, watch the bees coming to it, bumblebees, honeybees, all kinds of bees, make a count so that we know whether bees across the United States are increasing or decreasing. And that can tell us a lot about the health of environments in particular areas and do it on a much finer scale than we can do it with guys like me going out and doing a little bit of sampling. Or maybe you love weather, extreme weather. I love extreme weather. Join Kokoros, the citizen science site, doing a fine-grained measurement of rainfall, snowfall, great for here, hail, things like that, trying to look at patterns and building up an enormous database that can be used by all of us uh, in the future. So consider that. Become a citizen scientist. Go out there. Make your own discoveries. Contribute to a big project. But maybe, just maybe, as you're doing that, you'll make that accidental observation that will lead science in a different direction and that you can feel that, really, that rush of adrenaline that comes with making a really important discovery. Thank you.